Well, thank you, Bob, for that extremely kind and generous introduction. And one of the great things about being a Lincoln scholar is that people in the field, both professional historians and and people like Bob who are deeply committed uh, amateur students of Lincoln's life and career, uh, share with each other, they're friends with each other, that when they're working on projects and they discover stuff that's relevant for uh, their friends, they immediately notify them. So it's one of the most uh, rewarding experiences of my life is to be part of the Lincoln community because there's so much camaraderie and so much uh, good fellowship, uh, both, as I say, among the professional historians and, and the non-professional historians. Uh, so uh, and um, the original program, as I mentioned uh, at the, uh, this morning, included Gary Gallagher. Gary Gallagher is a very eminent Civil War historian. He's written a recent book called The Union War, which uh, Eric Foner trashed, and I thought that might be a nice, <laughs> a nice conflict <laughs> to have during the, uh, the, uh, the, the speaker's panel. Uh, but he, alas, had to drop out, and so, as I said, I had to scramble around to find a substitute and, and <laughs> scrape the bottom of the barrel, and here I am. Uh, so, uh, And also about, the, about Barack Obama. Um, that was a, it was a funny set of circumstances. I had been invited a week before Lincoln's 200th birthday, a week or two before, to uh, speak to the Democratic senators uh, who were meeting with the newly named cabinet here in town at the museum. If you've, ever, if you've never been to the museum, be sure to get there. It's, it's an amazing place. And so uh, all 50, then 57 Democratic senators were gathered together to hear and to talk with, respond to the newly named cabinet members, and I was to be the luncheon speaker. Uh, and, and I and, and my, my, my better half to be were invited, but we were sworn to secrecy. We can't tell what's going on here uh, because it was off the record. Uh, I said, well, that's fine. And uh, so I had been told uh, that I would have 20 minutes to speak. And then the president was going to come right after me. I said, well, that's, that's fine. Uh, and so I'm, I'm sitting next to Senator Durbin at lunch, and we're munching down. And... Uh, Somebody comes up and whispers something into Senator Durbin's ear. And then he turns to me and says, you've got to cut your talk short. You only got 10 minutes. The president's coming earlier than we had anticipated. And I said, oh, great. So just before you're about to go on, <laughs> you have to have your, your remarks. So I'm thinking, okay, um, what am I going to cut? How am I going to rearrange it? And so Durbin gets up to introduce me, and, and I'm still thinking about how I'm going to revise the talk. And... Uh, so I get up and I say, well, well, thank you for that, that uh, kind introduction, Professor Durbin. <laughs> and, and everybody cracks up. And I thought, well, what did I say to make everybody laugh? Uh, and they said, well. And then one of his colleagues said, hey, he just got a promotion. <laughs> <laughs> and and so, um, so I raced through my remarks. Uh, and then it turns out the president's running half an hour late. <laughs> he's, he's, he's not ahead, now, right? Right. So, so then I have a question and answer session for, with, with the senators, which actually with a group that size, it's, it's my preferred format. So, so that worked out very nicely. Um, and in anticipation of this event, The Green Monster had just been published, and my publisher wanted to get a copy to the cabinet members and to the senators and, and to the president. Uh, so anyway, so the, so the president comes, and he gives his remarks, and then an aide rushes in and says, Mr. President, you've got to get back to the White House. The, the, the stimulus bill needs your attention. And he said, well, you know, just a minute. I want to shake hands with my f- former colleagues here. And so he does. And then he comes over to Lois and me, shake our hands. And, um, and I was tempted to say, and I chickened out, but I was tempted, I understand my publisher has provided you with a copy of my book. Did you like it? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, <laughs> here it is. <laughs> um, now, this is a very intimidating volume, <laughs> or pair, pair of volumes. Um, uh, and for those of you who are uh, aghast at the uh, length of it and uh, the sticker price, um, I have a newly published book. <laughs> <laughs> this could be called the Reader's Digest Condensed Version of Volume 2. <laughs> it's called Lincoln in the Civil War, and it's very densely condensed. Um, uh, and one of, the, one of the things that is unfortunate, uh, but I wasn't able to persuade my publisher to do more with, was to provide illustrations for this book. 
I was, I was limited to a very small number, and I, I wanted some color. No way, Jose. I, it had to be black and white. It had to be relatively few. Well, since then, there has appeared a book, which I commend to your attention, called Lincoln Traveled This Way, which is a beautiful collection of, of fabulous photographs of spots that Lincoln would have been in. This, these are contemporary photographs taken by a very fine photographer, Bob Shaw. Bob's here. Wait, raise your hand, Bob. Bob, Bob is a very... <laughs> Bob's a very gifted photographer, and he spent five years taking the photographs that are in this book, and they're really beautiful. He doesn't horse around with Photoshop. He waits and waits until the light is just right, conditions are just right, and it's a beautiful job. And then he asked me to write the text, and I said, well, okay, I'll pillage the green monster and, <laughs> and provide some, some narrative text. So, but it's basically his book, and I wish it had come out at the time that the green monster had because there, there would be a good compliment, and it, it still is a good compliment. I just wish it had been available uh, back in uh, 09 when this was issued. Okay. Um, now, uh, let's get down to business here. Uh, before I address my, the announced topic, the indispensable man, I thought I'd respond to a, a question that, that Frank had, had uh, posed early to Eric Foner. What was the relationship between Lincoln and his father, and how, did, how was that significant? Now, have I addressed that here before? I don't think so. Okay. Lincoln's father... Uh, and Lincoln were deeply estranged, and that had a lot to do, in my view, with the origins of Lincoln's hatred of slavery. Because one of the things that uh, uh, John Barr was pointing out is that for a long time it was fashionable to talk about Lincoln as a reluctant emancipator. Well, it's just nonsense. Lincoln hated and loathed and despised slavery from the time he was young. He said it, and there's plenty of evidence to support it. I've always hated slavery as much as any abolitionist uh, I, I, but I thought it was on the way out, and therefore I didn't think it was an issue that needed to be addressed. But now that the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 has been addressed, introduced, slavery's on the march. So, uh, and uh, in the Hodges letter, he says the same thing. Uh, I have always hated slavery. I cannot remember when I did not so think and feel. Well, the question arises, where did that deep, profound hostility to slavery come from? And it manifests itself early on. Not only does Lincoln say this in the 1850s and the 1860s about how he'd always hated slavery, but when he was a young member of the Illinois State Legislature in his second term, in his, in his mid-20s, uh, the Illinois State Legislature was asked to join other state legislatures, southern state legislatures and some northern, to condemn the abolitionist movement. This was 1837. The abolitionist movement is just getting underway. Uh, southern states are uh, alarmed by this. Their legislatures appeal to the Illinois legislature and others, help us condemn this anti-slavery movement. And so Lincoln is then asked to join uh, his colleagues in voting on this measure, and by a vote of 77 to 6, that measure passes the Illinois House of Representatives in which Lincoln sat, and it passes unanimously in the Illinois State Senate. So of these 100 Illinois state legislators, six have the nerve to go against the grain not to support this condemnation of the abolitionist movement, to risk being identified with the abolitionists, or at least being soft on abolitionism. And when Lincoln was one of those six. And Lincoln wasn't from northern Illinois, he was from central Illinois, which is filled with Kentuckians, who bring with them no slaves, but bring with them pro-slavery attitudes. Of those six, two go a step further and introduce into the journal of the Illinois State House of Representatives a resolution stating, among other things, that slavery is based on injustice and bad policy. That's more radical. The, one of those two was Lincoln. And of those two, only one was running for re-election. The other guy was, had become a judge, and so he wasn't going to have to stand before the voters. So why does Lincoln, from central Illinois, in the year of 1837, an ambitious young politician, stick his neck out on the slavery issue? And then another piece of evidence suggesting that Lincoln's uh, statements about how he'd always hated slavery is accurate is uh, his record in Congress in 1849. He introduces or announces that he's going to introduce a bill abolishing slavery in the District of Columbia. Now, at the time, the issue that was before the Congress, uh, well, there were several, but one of them was maybe abolishing slave trading in Washington, 
But Lincoln goes a much further step and say, let's abolish slavery in the District of Columbia entirely. And he frames a bill, announces that he's going to introduce it, gets the approval of 15 leaders of Washington, D.C. society uh, to support it. Southerners say, if you pass legislation like this, we're going to break up the union. Those 15 withdraw their support. Lincoln then doesn't introduce the bill. But the fact that he was willing to go that far, that early, before uh, 1854, before the Kansas-Nebraska Act, indicates to me that Lincoln really did hate and loathe and despise slavery early on and was willing to run risks in order to manifest that. And so the question arises, where did that come from? Well, it wasn't from the atmosphere in which he was raised. If he had been born and raised in New England, that would be one thing. He wouldn't be such a surprise. But he was born in Kentucky, a slave state. Very little anti-slavery sentiment in Kentucky at that time. Then he moves at the age of seven with his family to southwestern Indiana, which is essentially transplanted Kentucky without slaves. But those people from Kentucky who moved there brought with them their pro-slavery values and attitudes. So Lincoln wasn't breathing from the age of seven to 21 uh, anti-slavery attitudes from the atmosphere in which he existed. Then he moves to central Illinois, also filled with Kentuckians. So it's not in the atmosphere here. So, and what's his field? He's an ambitious politician. He wants to win popular favor. Well, that's of some interest. Um, his parents, uh, insofar as we know, uh, had very little influence on his attitudes towards slavery. He marries into a Kentucky slaveholding family, so it's not his in-laws that are leading him to oppose slavery. So where does it come from? Well, I argue that if you look at Lincoln's writings about slavery, right up in, from, uh, till, till the second inaugural, one theme in his writings that he emphasizes to the virtual exclusion of all others, that is to say he doesn't use the traditional anti-slavery arguments about the breaking up of slave families, the cruelty to slaves, the erection of a, uh, an, a, a, a quasi-aristocratic social order in the South, the suppression of free speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press on behalf of slavery. He doesn't talk about those things. Instead, he emphasizes over and over again that it's an outrage that somebody goes out and works in the hot sun all day and somebody else derives all the profits. The slavery is organized, systematized robbery. And that's an outrage. Well, I thought, it's interesting that Lincoln makes this argument, not that he invented it, but that he makes it to the virtual exclusion of all the other anti-slavery arguments. And so I thought about that. And, well, why would that mean so much to him? Well, if you look at his relationship with his father, uh, I think the, the answer becomes clear. Lincoln's father and he did not get along. They were, they were pretty estranged. Uh, in fact, we know this because when Lincoln's father lay dying uh, outside Charleston, Illinois, about 100 miles from Springfield, uh, Lincoln receives a letter from his stepbrother, who's living with the father, saying, our father's dying and would like to see you now. Lincoln writes back and says, tell our father that it would be more painful and pleasant than pleasant if we were to see each other now. So that's pretty serious estrangement, right? So, uh, now why was Lincoln so estranged from his father? Well, as Eric was saying earlier, it's partly because Lincoln was ambitious and his father wasn't, but also I think it was because Lincoln really valued education. And he himself had less than one full year of f formal schooling. A little bit here, and, uh, a little bit there, and it all added up to less than a year. And one of the reasons he had so little education, his father kept yanking him out of school. Why? Because his father was improvident. His father would need money. His father oftentimes signed uh, guaranteed loans, and then the, the, the person who received the loan would default. And so he said, Lincoln, you've got to go work for the neighbors and make money and give it to me so that I can meet my obligations. So Lincoln would go out as a young adolescent and do hard, back-breaking labor, digging up stumps, chopping down trees, killing snakes, building fence rails, all that. And he might get 25 cents at the end of the day. And he would take that home and give it to his father. That was the law of the land. You were the property of your father until you were 21. It seemed to seem a little quaint to us in the 21st century to regard children as an economic asset, but that's the way it was back then. Um, and and so, so I think Lincoln unconsciously related to the slaves that he had gone out and worked in the hot sun all day and he had to turn over the, all of his money to his father and that's just what the slaves did. So he identified unconsciously with the slaves and he identified his father with the slaveholders. Okay, well, that's, that's a whole other subject. Oops. Um, okay, now Lincoln is the indispensable man. Um, 
Uh, Eric mentioned that uh, if, if you accept the notion that the, the North was bound to win the war because it had a superior industrial base and, and much larger numbers, then Lincoln's leadership doesn't really matter. The, the, the outcome of the Civil War was inevitable. Uh, in fact, however, it wasn't inevitable. The North did, of course, have a big advantage in economic strength and numbers, but the South had some offsetting advantages. Uh, for example, it didn't have to conquer the North. It simply had to fend the North off. It had, uh, and, and as, as I say at the beginning of, of the, the, the yellow pamphlet here, uh, um, that, that if uh, uh, an odds maker had been alive uh, in April of 1861, right after Fort Sumter, what kind of odds would he have given the South to win the war? At least, I think, even odds and maybe even favorable odds because it seemed entirely possible that European powers would intervene to keep the flow of cotton to textile mills in France and Britain flowing. So if you have outside intervention, that makes a big difference. The American colonists were able to defeat the British thanks largely to French support, French intervention in the Revolutionary War. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the Vietnamese were able to defeat the Americans largely through the intervention and help of, of uh, the, the Russians and the Chinese. Um, other small nations have won against large nations. The Dutch win their independence from Spain, for example. Uh, so it wasn't inevitable that the South would win. The South, other Southern advantages are obvious. Uh, the Southern military uh, leadership was superior, at least in the Eastern theater. Uh, southern morale was extremely high. They were fending off people who were invading their own country. So the victory of the South was not inevitable. If that's so, if, if, the, if it was a close call, what was the key variable that made it possible for the North to triumph in the Civil War? Well, years ago, a very distinguished historian, David M. Potter, argued that it was Lincoln's leadership. He said that if a man like Abraham Lincoln had been president of the South, and a man like Jefferson Davis had been president of the North, the South probably would have won. And I think there's a lot of truth in that, and which, is, which is counterintuitive, because if you look at the resumes of Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis, you would have thought that Jefferson Davis would be by far the superior war president. He was, after all, a West Point graduate. He was a war hero in the Mexican War. He was a very successful a secretary of war, he was a governor of Mississippi, senator of Mississippi, uh, whereas Lincoln's entire military experience was, was a few weeks in the Black Hawk War as a militiaman uh, in 1832. Uh, and, and no governorship, no senatorship, uh, no military training, uh, and the like. And yet Lincoln was a superior leadership, well, Lincoln's superior leadership really made the difference, according to Potter, and I think that's true. Now, there are a number of different ways in which Lincoln's leadership was superior to Jefferson Davis's in his ability to articulate the aims of the war and to inspire public confidence through his eloquence. Lincoln was far superior to Jefferson Davis. In his sense of political timing, he was far superior to Jefferson Davis. And you could go on and on. But the, the, the one aspect, aspect of Lincoln's leadership that I would like to lay heavy emphasis on is Lincoln's character. Lincoln's ability to do, uh, to unite the North, to keep all the factions and the regions of the North pulling together in order to achieve victory. Because the greatest threat to Northern uh, chances of winning the war was Northern disunion. And think of the challenge that Lincoln faced. You have to keep abolitionists in New England working in tandem with slaveholders in Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware, and Missouri. How do you keep slaveholders and abolitionists on the same page? Nice trick. Former Whigs and former Democrats. Now, partisan identification in those days was far greater and far stronger than it is in our own era. People really took their identification with the Whig Party or the Democratic Party very seriously. And the Whigs and the Democrats had been at each other's throats throughout the 1830s, 40s, and up into the early 1850s. And now this Republican Party has to take these two uh, antithetical elements, former Whigs and former Democrats, and keep them working in tandem. This is a real challenge. Um, prohibitionists had to make common cause with beer-loving uh, Germans in the Midwest. Uh, the, uh, the, the various factions within the Republican Party were uh, unstable, and Lincoln's greatest challenge was to keep that party united and thereby keep the North united. 
And how was he able to do that? It was because of his superior character and his psychological maturity. Lincoln, in my way, uh, to my way of thinking, is the most dramatic example in American history of a public figure who has achieved a level of psychological wholeness and maturity very unusual among people in general and particularly among people in politics. And when I say psycho- well, when I say psychological maturity, I mean, among other things, the ability not to take things personally, not to allow one's ego to get involved and, uh, and, and disrupt the, the main challenge, uh, the, the, what needs to be done in order to meet the main challenge before you. Now, we all have needy egos, uh, and some people more than others, particularly people in politics and show business. As you may know, uh, show business, uh, politics has sometimes been defined as show business for ugly people. <laughs> I'm, I don't have anybody in mind, but <laughs> think Harry Reid or Mitch McConnell, right? Uh, uh, so, uh, um, uh, and, uh, and yet Lincoln managed to, uh, almost miraculously, to overcome his own ego. He refused to take criticism personally. He refused to take personal snubs personally because he needed to keep the North united. He needed to keep the Republican Party united. And he demonstrated an almost superhuman magnanimity. Um, Perhaps the biggest, uh, most dramatic example of Lincoln's ability to overcome uh, his, what, what would be a normal human reaction to criticism and snubs is his dealings with George McClellan. Uh, George McClellan had been appointed, of course, commander of all the Union armies after the failure of Bull Run, and he was the only one with had any kind of uh, military success, a little bit out there in, in uh, western Virginia. Um, so he's brought in. Uh, General Scott says he's, he's the rising man, and, and so Lincoln says, okay, I'll give him a trot. Well, Lincoln is treated with the utmost contempt by George McClellan. McClellan's letters to his wife are filled with disparaging remarks about Lincoln as a baboon, as a poor old stick, as, a, as a somebody socially inferior and intellectually inferior, uh, a contemptible character. Um, and he doesn't merely express that contempt for Lincoln in letters to his wife, but it's also in his relations, personal relations with Lincoln. One of the most dramatic, then there are several dramatic examples, but one of the most dramatic is an uh, episode that occurs in November of 1861. Lincoln goes to McClellan's house to confer with him. Uh, He goes over with Secretary of State William Henry Seward, and he goes over with his assistant personal secretary, John Hay. And they're told by the servant at the McClellan home that the general's out. Uh, And so they say, okay, well, we'll sit here and wait for him. McClellan then comes in, walks right past him, goes upstairs, goes to bed, and has the servant come down and say, he can't see you, he's in bed. Uh, um, um, Hay uh, writes in his diary that he's just, he's boiling over with indignations. He, he talks about the insolence of epaulets. And Lincoln says, well, this is no time to be standing on personal points of pride. And this happens again and again. Uh, McClellan stands up, the governor of Ohio in Lincoln. Uh, and uh, Lincoln says, let's not get too upset. Um, if, uh, I will hold Link- uh, McClellan's horse if he will only give us victories. Um, Then on another occasion, McClellan stands up the whole cabinet and Lincoln. And Lincoln then shortly thereafter tells General Burnside, says, well, you know, McClellan doesn't, uh, maybe a good general and all that, but he doesn't have as much sense of etiquette as you do or I do. For example, he, he failed to show up for this cabinet meeting. They were all supposed to get together at noon. And after half an hour, Seward said he's got things to do. And then after an hour, everybody else said they had things to do. And finally, at 2.30, McClellan comes wandering in. And I said, well, what happened? Where were you? You're supposed to be here at noon. And McClellan said, I forgot. And Lincoln tells Burnside, I'm reminded of a court case that I had down in central Illinois way back when. And uh, I was defending a guy who had been accused of rape. And he, he was accused by this woman of having committed an outrage uh, one day and then on the next day. And so I was defending this guy, and uh, so, so I asked the woman on cross-examination, I said, now, now my client uh, uh, committed rape twice, assaulted you one day and then the next day. And she says, that's right. And, and Lincoln says, well, in between those two events, did you sleep with your husband? She says, well, yes. Well, did, did you tell him what had happened the first time? And, and she said, no. And he said, well, why? And she says, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> So, 
So, so, so, and, and, and yet Lincoln, when, when, when the crisis, of the, one of the major crises of the war occurs after the Second Battle of Bull Run, when, when General Pope fails miserably, he's, he's replaced McClellan more or less, uh, and Lincoln has to, re, has to put a new general in charge. Who does he put in charge? McClellan. Not because he, he liked McClellan, not because he appreciated the way he'd been treated, but because he was the only general who could keep morale in the army and keep the army together. So he swallowed his pride. He, he wouldn't take things personally and all these snubs and uh, reinstates McClellan. And you have similar examples of magnanimity in dealing with uh, Sam and Chase, for example. Lincoln showed remarkable patience. Chase uh, was constantly scheming behind Lincoln's back to steal the nomination in 1864 for the presidency. Um, Lincoln ignored all that. Uh, Time and again, Chase tried to dominate the administration by saying, if you don't make this appointment or adopt this policy, I'm going to resign. And he tries it once, and Lincoln says, okay, I'll back down. And he tries it twice, and Lincoln says, okay, I'll back down. He tries it a third time, and Lincoln says, okay, I'll back down. Tries it a fourth time, and Lincoln says, okay, I accept. You know, right when you get work. <laughs> Good luck. Um, uh, and, uh, <laughs> uh, but... And, 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 and Montgomery Blair, the postmaster general, said that Chase was probably the only guy that Lincoln really hated. And I think there's probably some truth in that because he could be pretty hateful. Um, uh, and yet, in October of 1864, a few months after Chase's resignation was accepted, the Chief Justice of the United States, Roger B. Taney, dies. And Lincoln then has to appoint a new Chief, Just Chief Justice. And there's all kinds of people contending for that post, and, and he, Lincoln is, is deluged with letters supporting uh, various candidates. But he chooses Chase, and he, he says, um, if my personal considerations were the only thing that were uh, affecting my decision, I would rather eat the chair that I'm sitting in <laughs> or swallow hot andirons. <laughs> um, <laughs> but... He's an important leader of the radical wing of the Republican Party. We need that wing of the Republican Party to keep the North united, keep the party united. And uh, since he's left the cabinet, uh, radicals feel as though we ought to have some important position, so we're going to give it to him. Uh, and then he showed incredible magnanimity in appointing uh, the uh, Secretary of War, Edwin M. Stanton. Uh, as Dan was mentioning, the uh, appointment of Simon Cameron is a pretty clear indication that Lincoln didn't think there was going to be a war. Um, and uh, and uh, Cameron turns out to be utterly inept. And so Lincoln has to find a replacement for him a few months into the war. And the replacement has to be from Pennsylvania because he needed a Pennsylvanian. The state loyalty and state identification was very important then. Pennsylvania was a really big and important state. So he needed Cameron was from Pennsylvania, so he had to replace him with a Pennsylvanian. You had to replace it with a former Democrat because there should be an even number of former Whigs and former Democrats at cabinet meetings. Um, and it had to be somebody who was competent, capable. This was a tremendous job. Being Secretary of War uh, during the American Civil War was, was an enormous challenge. And so he chose Edwin M. Stanton, a former Democrat from Pennsylvania, very capable, and with, with a reputation as a good, solid unionist because he had served in Buchanan's cabinet in the very last stages of that president's uh, uh, administration and helped shore up his, his unionism, such as it was. Um, and, uh, and that was an incredibly magnanimous gesture because Stanton had ridiculed and insulted Lincoln back in 1855 on a trial where they were both involved in a, in a very important patent case out in Cincinnati. And time and again, and over this week-long trial, Stanton snubbed him, treated him with contempt, uh, and when Lincoln decided to appoint Stanton, one of the co-lawyers out there said to him, how can you do that? You know, Lincoln said, look, uh, uh, I didn't like being treated that way by Stanton, but the important thing is to win the war. And he is the obvious candidate for this job, and so personal considerations have to be left aside. Uh, and so it, it's my argument in, 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 what, uh, in what I've written in the, in the uh, Green Monster and also in the Yellow Pamphlet uh, is that the... The, the leadership quality of Lincoln that was most important that made him such a successful president was his uh, incredible psychological maturity uh, and that, that he should be an inspiration for us all and think if he hadn't had that leadership, if he hadn't had that character, if he hadn't had that, that ability to rise above the t petty tyranny of the ego, if the North had lost the Civil War, 
uh, imagine what might have happened. Uh, the cause of democracy in the world would have been set back dramatically. Uh, this, the United States would have broken up probably into several different uh, uh, squabbling and perhaps even warring uh, divisions over time. Uh, and uh, slavery might have persisted well into the 20th century. So uh, Lincoln, I think, is the indispensable man for making it possible for the North to prevail in the Civil War. I, I thank you for your attention. I would be happy to try to field questions, comments. Uh, yes, John. Michael, um, there's one episode uh, involving Chase and Lincoln and some senators. It's been called the Cabinet Crisis uh, after Fredericksburg. Uh, could you say a little about how Lincoln handled things in the Cabinet Crisis? Sure, that, that's a good point. One of Lincoln's most statesmanlike, uh, one of Lincoln's greatest challenges to his statesmanship occurs in the aftermath of the terrible defeat at Fredericksburg in mid-December 1862. Uh, Northern morale plunged, uh, great indignation with the administration, uh, and the uh, uh, Senate was convinced, but large numbers of Republican senators were convinced that the failure of Union arms was a result of Seward's malign influence over Lincoln and that Seward had to be gotten rid of. And they had been convinced that Seward was Lincoln's evil genius by Chase. Chase and Seward were the two leading personalities in the cabinet, and they had different ideologies and, and very strong personalities, very ambitious men. Um, and so when, <clears throat> when, <clears throat> when Lincoln was informed of this and when Seward heard about it, Seward offered his resignation right away. I don't want to do anything that can embarrass you. Uh, and Lincoln said, well, let's just think about that. Uh, and so the senators came over to complain about how Seward had been a malign influence, how the cabinet didn't meet often enough, how there had to be a, a, re, uh, a restructuring of the cabinet, uh, and Seward had to go. Uh, and Lincoln said, well, all right, I'll, I'll take all these objections into consideration. Uh, and so um, he invites the senators back the next day, and he invites the cabinet to meet with them. And Chase, uh, Chase is going to be on the spot because he's going to have to say in front of the president and his fellow cabinet members what he's been saying uh, uh, secretly behind their backs uh, to the senators. And so Chase tries to back out of it, but Lincoln won't let him. So the next day, the senators come. They're surprised to see not just Lincoln but the cabinet, and Lincoln says, okay, uh, now rehearse your, your uh, arguments to me in front of the cabinet and, uh, well, is it true that the cabinet doesn't meet very often, doesn't really discuss significant issues? And so Lincoln asked the cabinet, is that true? And they said, well, you know, we don't meet all the time, but you know, we're together most of the time on important issues. Um, and uh, all the senators start looking at Chase and say, you know, what, <laughs> what's going on here? Uh, and Chase was humiliated, mortified. It was very shrewd of Lincoln to, to put him on the spot that way. Chase then submits his resignation because he's so embarrassed. Uh, uh, Chase says, I've been thinking about submitting my resignation. And Lincoln says, give me that. Give me that. <laughs> um, so he takes it. Now he says, I've got a pumpkin in each saddlebag. Now I can ride. Both of you guys go back to work. Uh, and it was a way of keeping the Republican Party united because Chase was the leading member of the radical wing and Seward was the leading member of the conservative wing. And then you needed those wings to be kept together. And it was, it was a brilliant stroke on Lincoln's part and, a, and a, one of the best examples of his statesmanship in action. Yes, Frank, you have a question, or a question, an uh, observation. Professor, uh, Dr. Whoop. Michael, uh, <laughs> something, I did not want to be up here. I have some timid friends and even some timid uh, good historians back there. Uh, between you and Professor Daniel, I, I think it'd really be good uh, just maybe to hear a little of the humanization. We're almost at the epicenter Maybe it's towards Manassas, maybe it's Front Royal or, or wherever of, of some of the most spectacular things and uh, human things like you just go through the list, the North and the South and Jubal Early and Whites Ferry and Bell Boy. That, I won't even say them all, but could you just uh, maybe comment uh, on the fact that today my neighbors on High Knob Mountain, which is right outside of Front Royal, still have in their attics letters from Lincoln, Lincoln's friends. They well, do? Not Lincoln Give himself, me their names. But on the Civil War. <laughs> I, I just want to, 
to let people know that uh, for the ones around here, th this spirit of place is there for the Civil War, and Lincoln is certainly indispensable. Well, that's uh, to be in Washington and suburban Washington. Well, actually, I grew up. I, I, uh, I was born in Washington and raised in Arlington. Uh, so I'm a Virginian, although some Virginians would deny that. Um, uh, and and as one of the things that, that made me become a Lincoln scholar, as I think I may have mentioned a couple of years ago, is, is that I was raised here in, in this town. Um, and the, the, the presence of, of the spirit of Lincoln and the, the memories of the Civil War, of course, are extremely uh, vivid here. And, and to be able to go to Ford's Theater. And by the way, how many of you have been to Ford's Theater to the new uh, education center? Uh, it's really terrific. Those of you who haven't been there should, should really pay it a visit. It's, it's a remarkable uh, achievement, uh, particularly the Tower of Books. <laughs> Which don't include the, the Green Monster, by the way, because it doesn't have a, it doesn't have any cover art, unfortunately. Uh, but to be able to, to to be in the presence of Port Ford's Theater, the White House, the Capitol, the Manassas, uh, Antietam, uh, all that is uh, uh, makes it a, a very uh, very strong living presence for us. And and um, as I say in the, in the close of the of the Green Monster. Uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, is, uh, commands our respect and attention, and not just as the uh, great emancipator, uh, and not just as the savior of the union, and not just as the vindicator of democracy, all of which he was, uh, but also because of his personal character. That it's, it's, uh, it's extremely, to my way of thinking anyway, inspirational to read the life story of Abraham Lincoln because he was able to overcome this, this, this terrible relationship with his father. His mother dies when he's nine years old in terrible circumstances. Imagine a, a, a nine-year-old boy watching his mother writhing for a week in pain and, and as she dies before his very eyes. Uh, the early death of his mother, the estrangement of his father. He had two siblings, uh, an infant brother who dies in infancy and an older sister who dies in childbirth when Lincoln was uh, a teenager. So he loses them. His, his foster grandparents die at the same time his mother does, a little nine-year-old boy. These, these terrible traumas. So Lincoln was able to overcome that. Then, as an adult, he had to wrestle with depression. Lincoln suffered from depression so serious at times that on two occasions he was suicidal and his friends had to remove all sharp objects from his reach lest he do himself in. So he had to deal with depression. Um, he had to deal with a very painful midlife crisis. As Eric was saying earlier, Lincoln campaigned for uh, office almost from the t every election cycle from the age of 23 till, till, 18, till he was 51 um, or, or 56, um, except one five-year period during which time he really dropped out of politics for all intents and purposes. And it was a very painful midlife crisis from the age of 40 to age 45. He had a very difficult marriage. Everything you've heard about Mary Todd and how impossible and ornery and difficult she was is inaccurate. She was worse. Um, uh, uh, and, and poor Mary Lincoln. She's more to be pitied than censured, but she really made his life pretty unhappy. Um, on top of that, he has, uh, his children die. Uh, two of his four children died during his own lifetime. Um, he has to overcome defeats. He's defeated for the Senate twice. Um, he's defeated the first time he runs for the legislature. He's defeated the first time he runs for, the, for, for Congress. He's defeated when he tries to uh, win the commissionership of the general land office after his congressional term. So all these things that Lincoln had to deal with, he managed to overcome and become the, the most remarkably psychologically whole and balanced figure in American history. And I think that... Um, very few of us, uh, when we think of Lincoln as an inspirational figure, the traditional uh, uh, view of Lincoln as an inspirational figure is that he was raised in poverty, which he really was, uh, and that he managed to rise above the, the poverty of uh, the frontier in Kentucky and southwest Indiana. And all that's true. But what I'm particularly impressed by is Lincoln's ability to rise above psychological poverty. And there are an awful lot of us who don't suffer from economic poverty, oftentimes have psychological poverty, and yet... Lincoln was able to overcome all this and to become this model of psychological wholeness and balance, and I find that uh, is one of the most inspirational features of Lincoln's life for me. Well, enough editorializing. Yes, sir. There have been several conversations today, including by you, about how Lincoln dealt with individuals right. and how he dealt with his party. Right. Can you say something about how he dealt with Congress as an institution? Because there was also discussion in the morning right. about 
taking action before they even got there or, or ramming things through later on. Right. Um, and one of, one of the criticisms that's, that's been made of Lincoln is that, uh, that he, uh, he takes those decisions that Eric Foner was talking about. Um, in, uh, for in the ten weeks after the bombardment of Fort Sumter, he doesn't call Congress into session. He calls Congress in session July 4th. The bombardment of Sumter was April 12th. So for 10 weeks, he was virtually a dictator. So why didn't he call Congress into session? Well, the main reason is that not all of the members of Congress had been elected by that time. In those days, uh, the election cycles were different from the way they are now. Today, it's standardized. We have congressional elections every November or every even year, um, even numbered year. Uh, But in those days... uh, a, a, a Congress that was elected in November of 1862, for example, doesn't take office, doesn't sit until December of 63. There's a 13-month gap between the election and the, the opening of that Congress. And so many states, not all but many, during that 13-month gap held their congressional elections. A lot of states in November, but several other states wait till uh, uh, early in the next year or the middle of the next year. And several states hadn't elected any congressional representatives uh, by April 12, 1861. And so that Congress would have been considered illegitimate. And so Lincoln's decision to postpone the summoning of Congress was not just an act of arbitrary uh, desire on his part to act the dictator, but because he wanted to have a... And he was also... He wasn't entirely sure that Washington would be safe, that that if a Congress met, the the Confederates might overrun the city. So... um, so in that sense, I don't think he was uh, contemptuous of Congress. And, uh, and it should be remembered, as Eric pointed out, Lincoln was a Whig. The Whig Party was founded in opposition to strong presidential leadership of Andrew Jackson. The Whig Party w- uh, was called the Whig Party because the Whigs in England had been the party that had opposed the power of the king and, and had championed the power of parliament. Well, the Whigs in this country were those who said King Andrew, referring to Jackson, had to be resisted. And so they, and and Andrew Jackson was very forceful. He used the veto a lot. Um, And so the Whigs said the president should defer to the Congress. And Lincoln was was a Whig, and he really accepted that. And during his presidency, Lincoln deferred to Congress on economic matters, non-war-related matters. Uh, he has very little to say about some of the most important legislation that's passed during the Civil War by Congress. He, he, does, he doesn't do much with, with the Homestead Act, uh, the Land Grant College Act, uh, the, the high tariff, uh, the national banking, well, a little bit with the Banking Act, and a little bit with the National Railroad Act, too. Uh, but in general, he said, that's, that's Congress's business. Let them make domestic policy. Now, when it comes to war making, that's something that the president, by virtue of his status as commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy, and by virtue of his status as the president who's sworn to protect and uphold, uh, defend the Constitution, he has to be assertive. But in general, Lincoln was pretty deferential to Congress on non-war-related matters. Where they really clash was over Reconstruction. Lincoln regarded Reconstruction and the, the proposal that he puts forward to the South to, be, to gain readmission to the Union uh, as a way to shorten the war. Um, well, that's a complicated subject, but uh, in December of 63, he puts forward a reconstruction plan, which then Congress doesn't much like, and Congress passes an alternative reconstruction plan, uh, which Lincoln vetoes, and there at some loggerheads. Uh, but basically, Congress was, was somewhat uh, uh, jealous of Lincoln's assertions of executive authority and war-making powers, and felt, well, Lincoln can conduct the war as he sees fit because he is, after all, the commander-in-chief of the Army and the Navy, but when it comes to peacemaking, that's our... So it was, there was some jurisdictional jealousy over that. So that was the... But, but the, the difference between Congress and the president over Reconstruction was largely because uh, Congress wanted it to be a post-war p- phenomenon. Lincoln wanted to use it as a way to shorten the war, to encourage the South to throw in the towel. Once the war was over, Lincoln moves dramatically toward Congress. On April 11, 1865, he gives a speech in which he says, uh, I believe that some blacks should be allowed to vote, at, at least those who have served in the, as soldiers and those who are very intelligent. And as I think I, I made the point a couple of years ago, uh, that's what got him killed. But clearly he was moving toward a rapprochement with Congress over Reconstruction because you didn't have to inveigle the South into surrendering. They had, already, they, they had been inveigled into surrendering by Grant and Sherman and Sheridan and Thomas and, and the armies of the Union. So that's a long answer to a short question. Thank yes, you. Michelle. 
I'm going to break my own moderator rule and tell a quick story, but I think Michael's going to appreciate it. At the Library of Congress, we have checkout registers that reflect what people, what people in Congress and the President were checking out during the Civil War period. And when I first looked at this checkout register, of course, many of you know the story, that when Lincoln was frustrated with McClellan particularly, he checked out from the Library of Congress Halleck's Art of War, or Science of War. And he checked that out in January of 1862, when things were not going well. And I just noticed the other day that the book was returned in March of 1864, right before he appointed Grant as Lieutenant General, which I thought was great. But when I do a little show and tell with this, when you look down the page, so I always refer to this as, as Lincoln was checking out a DIY manual, kind of a do-it-yourself <laughs> how, to, how to run a war. Further down on the page is a book title called How Paul Farrell Killed His Wife, <laughs> which I... <laughs> You see where I'm going with this? <laughs> I'm going to use that. So I thought, oh, so it, it turns out it's Victorian literature, so I'm sure Mary was checking it out <laughs> in addition to Victor Hugo. But right. I always tell people, I wonder if Lincoln thought it was another DIY manual and was very disappointed. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Michelle. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, in uh, uh, February of 1861, um, Lincoln departed by uh, train uh, from Springfield and delivered uh, an apparently impromptu and eloquent address to his townspeople, about 700 of them. Uh, you have mentioned uh, Lincoln's uh, dysfunctional upbringing, his, I think that's... That's uh, fair, 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 fair uh, his, characterization. Uh, fairly undis his undistinguished military time and time in Congress... Uh, so uh, how was it that he departed from Springfield a, an indispensable man? Is there something to do with the 23 or however many years uh, that he lived in that town uh, that, that made him one? Well, and I think the that, answer is too long, uh, Alex. Well, okay, well, I'll, I'll try to, to keep a, 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 my response relatively brief. Uh, Lincoln's ability to be a successful political leader had something to do with the fact that he had lived in Springfield for over two decades and had dealt with the people of all walks of life, black, white, uh, rich, poor, middle class, uh, and then as a, as a lawyer. Uh, you couldn't make enough money as a lawyer in Springfield, just staying in Springfield in the 1830s, 40s, and into the 50s. So every spring and every fall, the lawyers of Springfield would all get together with a judge and they'd go around... Uh, ride the circuit, as it was called. They, so they go from one count, they go from one county seat for a week to another county seat for a week, and all the farmers would sue each other, and, and uh, there, there would be all kinds of legal cases. And he argued before jurors uh, regularly, and then he would socialize with the lawyers, he would socialize with the townspeople. So he really got, as, as a result of living in central Illinois, traveling the circuit, being involved in politics, uh, he really got a feel for, for public opinion, particularly in central Illinois. Now, central Illinois is, is, uh, uh, represents the confluence or the overlapping of, of, a, of a stream of, of northerners and southerners. Uh, Illinois is, is a funny state. Uh, the, you've got northern Illinois, is basically northern, southern Illinois, is basically southern, and middle Illinois is a combination of the two. And that was that way then, it's that way now. Um, you've got Cubs fans and Cardinals fans, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's deeply divided. Um, and uh, so Lincoln had some sense of what both southern and northern public opinion was like. And, and, and it wasn't just from reading books or reading newspapers. He, he lived it for 23 years uh, or more. And therefore, I think that helped give him that, that uncanny ability he had to sense public opinion in, during the Civil War when there were no public opinion polls, there were no uh, exit polls, uh, there were no focus groups. Um, uh, and, and so his, his uh, intuitive ability to appreciate public opinion, I think, was, was profoundly shaped by his experience of living over two decades in central Illinois. It's a good point. Yes, yes, sir. You know, uh, this is a follow-up question uh, because you make such a cogent argument about his psychological maturity, far beyond what you've just said about his ability to tap into different attitudes about politics. I mean, where did that come from? That's, that's a good question. Um, I, I argue in, in my books that one of the things that made Lincoln such a successful and psychologically whole and mature person is that, that he went through a very successful midlife crisis. That between the age of 40 and 45, he drops out of politics, and he seems to be doing nothing important. 
Uh, he, you look at his correspondence in that period, it's almost all related to law, and very little about politics. Uh, and he says later in autobiographical statements that he writes that he was losing interest in politics at that time. Uh, and so th- that period of, of 1849 to 1854, from the age of 40 to the age of 45, seems like a dry, fallow period, uninteresting period in Lincoln's life. And yet I argue that that's one of the most profoundly important periods in Lincoln's life because during that period he grew tremendously. Now Eric was talking about Lincoln's growth and it's something of a, of a cliche to talk about how presidents grow in office, that the pressures of office and the, uh, the uh, powers that you have at your disposal really force you to grow or, or, or can. Um, and, uh, but, but in fact, all the qualities most of the qualities that made Lincoln a successful president, you can see in Lincoln between 1854 and 1861. That is, between the time that, that, that he comes out of his midlife depression, throws himself back into politics as a result of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and then, then is elected president. In those seven years, he's deeply involved in the anti-slavery crusade and establishing the Republican Party in Illinois and making it viable, which was a real trick, getting the northern Illinoisans to co- cooperate with the southern Illinoisans and the central Illinoisans. Um, and so the, the, the ability to get people to cooperate with each other, the sense of political timing, the, the, the tact, the diplomacy, the, the unwillingness to take things personally, uh, not holding a grudge against the people who had helped defeat him for, for the Senate in 1855 when he should have won, um, all those qualities made, made him a great political leader in that seven-year period, and also those qualities made him a great president. But they were developed somehow, mysteriously, in this period between uh, 1849 and 1854. And and we know from modern clinical studies that a lot of men between in their early 40s go through a profound period of introspection. It's not just running off with your secretary in a red sports car. I mean, that's that's the the kind of journalistic cliche of of the midlife crisis. But for an awful lot of men, uh, the early 40s represent a period when you go through intense introspection. Have I made the right marital choice? Have I made the right career choice? Have I spent too much of my time and energy trying to please the collective? Have I ignored my own inner resources? What do I want to leave as a legacy? Um, Those kinds of questions. Uh, And out of that brooding and introspection can come stagnation, can come regression, but some people, as a result of that introspection, grow dramatically. And they become much more psychologically whole, much more mature, much more the the true selves that they were meant to be. And I think Lincoln is one of the most dramatic examples in American history of a a man who goes through a successful midlife crisis and grows dramatically. Now, why does he have a successful midlife crisis and other people don't? I I don't know. Um, It's a mystery. Right. It's a mystery. Um, Oh, and and apropos of of my psychological explanation of Lincoln's hatred of slavery... um, uh, I, sh- I should add, by the way, that, that Steve Goldman doesn't believe that this is a legitimate enterprise, <laughs> that is, to, to, psychological, to engage in psychological interpretation. Isn't that right, Steve? You told me that once. Uh, I'll, no, <laughs> okay, all right, okay. <laughs> well, let, okay, but let, let me finish this line of thought. Uh, I, I make a, a psychological argument there about his father and all that, but it's occurred to me since then that there's something else involved that, that can't be explained in psychological terms, historical terms, what have you. And that is that some children have sensitive consciences that are more sensitive than other children. Um, uh, And Lincoln had an exceptionally sensitive conscience as a child. And we know that because when he was growing up in uh, in southwest Indiana, uh, he used to scold his playmates for their cruelty to animals. It was considered uh, great fun on the frontier for young boys to take uh, snakes and throw them into the fire and watch them sizzle and uh, take turtles and smash them against trees and watch them quiver and then put a hot coal on their backs and things like that. And we know that Lincoln uh, spoke out against that cruelty to animals, uh, that he also spoke out against, um, uh, well, in in general about about cruelty to animals. Now, anybody who's sensitive to cruelty to animals is probably going to be sensitive to cruelty to slaves. Um, And where does that come from? Well, it's impossible to say. A sensitive conscience, I think, is something you're either born with or, or, or you don't have. So psychological explanations can't always... Now, we've only got a couple of minutes before adjournment, but Steve, suck it to me. <laughs> Michael, you seem to forget we met over your book, which I felt was one of the most psychologically astute You were very kind, and I, I appreciate Lincoln. that very much. The caution, as always, is twofold, is... Because it's Lincoln, we can ascribe events that are not that major in someone else's life, and we put a lot of emphasis in that. 
I always ascribe to the Citizen Kane theory of a man's life, of a human being's life. Rosebud was, Rosebud was a red herring. And there's that great analogy at the end that it's a life is a jigsaw puzzle. It's not just one piece. It's the essence of that in terms of that. Lincoln, though, you know, but Michael, remember, of a man of his era, he didn't hunt, he didn't smoke, he didn't drink, which also set him apart in relation to that. Your books and others have shown that people always saw there was something different about him. But the two things that remain unknowable, and no one knows more about Lincoln than you do, is the distance that people still did feel from him, yeah. even the people who felt the closest yeah. to him. Yeah. And his humor was a defense in other ways in relation to that. And the second thing, which you and I talk about as astonishing, is the incredible self-confidence to ignore yeah. Yeah. a snub from McClellan, from a Stanton and others, and with the exception of McClellan, the way Stanton felt about Lincoln as he knew him, the relationship that he had with Seward, which were tremendous things for him, as we know, during his administration, that kinds of aspect. Trying to figure out why someone does successfully and someone doesn't is yeah. almost impossible to do. Yeah. That's the caution, yeah. not that the effort shouldn't be made. Well, well put. Okay. I didn't mean to misrepresent <laughs> you, but, but well taken. Well taken. Okay, I see you. It's one minute before five.